Hi, uh, my name's David Lilly. Uh, I work for myself uh, under the name Hollis Consulting. I've done work in the community sector for probably about 20 years with a particular emphasis on place-based work, um, typically across sectors. So involving community members, the public sector, NGOs or the social sector, and sometimes business as well. Oh good, and we're up. So look, I guess my starting point for, for this conversation is to say that co-design, I think, offers a lot of potential to the social sector and to communities themselves. But I think when something has a real sort of upside, real potential, it also comes with a lot of risk. And the risk is that people apply the term to things that are not real co-design. They sort of bastardise the concept. Um, and so that's, I guess, a, a theme that I, I want to sort of carry throughout this presentation. Yeah. What does authentic co-design look like with community and what are some of the, the, the opportunities and the, the risks? Sorry, could we go back? Whoop. So very quickly, um, co-design, people will know what it is from, from what Jax has just said, but broadly, participatory or collaborative design of products, services, policies, projects, etc. The, the three questions I really want to think about are who participates in the process, on what terms, and for how long. So up here broadly, we've got these, these four sort of scenarios. Co-design, as I understand it, often Often the people who are doing fairly rigorous co-design come from the corporate world because I think that's where the money has been to do co-design. And so I've noticed a lot of corporates sort of moving into the social space and there are sometimes a couple of things that they miss. One is that when you're doing co-design within a, an individual organisation, you've got a CEO or a, you know, a business unit leader who gives permission for staff to participate. So you know, the opportunity is there, you're encouraged and perhaps required to go to a co-design event. That's really different when you're working across stakeholder groups. Um, so the same goes with you know, co-design across organisations. In the social space, you often get organisations working in, say, youth services who decide they want to do some co-design work together. And they're quite similar organisations, and again, they have that internal permission. But things change dramatically when you start involving community members. And I'd make a, a distinction between involving community members in what's essentially an organisational co-design process and involving them in something that's more community-led, you know, where there's local ownership and participation. Very quickly, on, on community, I think it's really hard to talk about co-design and community without defining community in some way. The way I think about community is that you've got a bunch of individuals who have a home life, a home context, that can be really different for different people. Some people have you know, really reassuring parents who give them every opportunity in life. Some kids experience domestic violence, etc. You've got a social environment that may suit some people and not other people. You might have your know, sort of monocultural situation where people from different ethnic backgrounds find it hard to fit in. Or you might have amazing diversity in community events that bring people together. You've got a physical environment uh, that includes you know, public transport and roads and shops and community centres and other things and you've got an institutional environment, you've got a network of service providers who may or may not be working together. So for me, when we're talking about community, we're talking about all of those domains and how they do or don't support and enable individual opportunity. I think it's also really important in, in thinking about co-design to consider the nature of the relationship between the people involved in the co-design process. So often you have community members who are called in to work with service providers you know, if they're not properly briefed, they're kind of like deer in headlights. They, they don't really know how they're supposed to fit in. They might not have the language that other people in the room are using, etc. So I distinguish between these sort of four levels of relationships. One's a negative, hostile or exploitative relationship. And I've seen this in my background working in public housing, where public housing tenants of this, oh, oh, excuse me, often invited into processes because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to involve tenants in decision making. But they're not really there on equal terms. They're there so someone can tick a box and say, we engaged, you know, whatever it is that we do, whatever we decide, it's okay, it's legitimate. Then move to a sort of level one relationship around acknowledgement, civility, and a transactional process. Um, and I think that's, you know, where you're sort of respectful to a point. You bring people together to co-design something, but you probably 
you, know, you might not have seen them before, you might not follow up with them again, it's just uh, about the process itself. Then a level two relationship is about recognising someone as a unique person. And for me, if we're going to involve community members in co-design, it, it's level two that we need to get to. We need to understand people, we need to understand their lives, we need to understand what will help them to participate in a co-design session on equal terms with other people before we even invite them into the room. So there's a, a big relationship building element for me in co-designing with community. But obviously level three relationships are going just a bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I borrowed this from a consulting firm, Twyford Consulting, and I really like it. Uh, they talk, they've got a book called The Power of Co. And so it's, it's not exactly co-design, it's sort of co from the beginning, um, committing to collaboration through co-defining a dilemma that you want to respond to. A co-design process to start working out solutions, co-creating the solutions and moving people to be involved in the development of the solution, not just its sort of abstract design, and right through to co-delivering on actions. So for me, I really like that idea that when you involve community, it's not in a design session, it's in a process from beginning to end. And you could probably add a couple of things at the beginning there, as I said in the previous slide, around relationship building and making sure people are confident and comfortable and ready. So I'm just gonna jump into a couple of projects that I've worked on over the years. This is a master plan for Minto Public Housing Estate. Some of you may know Minto in Southwest Sydney. Back in 2002, roughly, I was working in housing and the Minister for Housing decided that there was going to be a redevelopment of the Minto Public Housing Estate. And essentially, there were plans drawn up, this is not the plan that was originally drawn up, but there were plans drawn up and the announcement to community, however, if you go to the next slide, was not we are going to work with you and we're going to design a new neighbourhood, we're going to design a new estate. It was literally a minister going out to Minto, standing up in front of the community and saying, the housing here is not good enough, we don't like it, and we're going to send in the bulldozers. And this happened in a community that had, had lots of community development done with and to people. Uh, community members, I think, felt like they had a, a genuine sort of role in determining their own future and deciding what would happen in the neighbourhood. And, you know, suddenly one day, literally someone says, we're, we're bringing in bulldozers. And within a couple of weeks of that announcement, people started to be reallocated, you know, re, sorry, rehoused from their home uh, in the first precinct to be redeveloped. So there was sort of literally no opportunity for, for co-design at all. I was involved in the project and really I fairly intentionally removed myself from it because I felt quite uncomfortable with it. In 2005, I was asked to go back to Minto uh, to develop uh, a sort of a social plan with community, how they could be supported during the redevelopment process and also how a, a new community could be sort of cultivated and invigorated. Um, first meeting I went to, I, I sat down with a group of stakeholders and told them that I'd been asked to write a community renewal plan for Minto. And a rather intimidating woman literally stood up and said, you are not renewing our community. You are fucking destroying it. So that was my introduction to what became working together at Minto. So in response to that, sort of jump up and said, look, it's okay, I understand what's been going on, I understand you know, your frustration and your anger. What I want to do is I want to work with you to design, I probably didn't use the word design back then in 2005, what I want to do is design with you a social plan that will meet your needs, that will help to sustain you and your family now through a transition into other housing and beyond. Then, Fast forward about 10 years, and I more recently did some work in Mount Druitt. Um, I went out there to run a collective impact project, and I thought, this is gonna be easy street. Like, I had that memory of Minto in my mind, you know, about how you don't do this. You don't impose something horrible on community and then say, we wanna work with you to make it okay. So I went out to uh, Mount Druitt, and the idea was this collective impact project where we would support particularly children to create a sort of generational change. You know, start school well, um, stay in school, get jobs, etc., etc. You know the, the sort of drill. One of the things that we did quite early on was run uh, what we called the swarm. 
uh, it was an opportunity to bring together around 75 people, roughly equal numbers of people from business, community, government and NGOs. And we spent two days designing uh, a sort of you know, process and uh, an approach together. And I haven't got time to go into to great detail, but the thing I'd point out is we had some fantastic co-designers involved in this, and I'll mention two of them, um, Liz Cameron-Smith and Emma Schumach, who are at the Impact Assembly at PwC, and they did a fantastic job. We had an amazing event and we had an amazing product. There were a couple of downsides though, and I'll take ownership of them, we probably held the event at not quite the right time. Because what we did was we brought a bunch of people together, we worked out what we wanted to do, and one of the, the sort of variables that we had to, to nail down was we decided we'd work with naught to five-year-olds. And we had some parents in the room of kids who were, say, seven, eight, nine. One, one parent in particular was incredibly hostile when she realised that we were working on an initiative that wouldn't benefit her child. So she was angry and said, how dare you involve me in this process? I have this child who has you know, all these incredible needs and I haven't you know, been able to address them in the existing service system. You come here offering hope, but not for me. Mm -hmm. So you know, I had to take that on board. You know, number one, we probably hadn't thought enough about the implications of the decisions we were going to make during the process. We probably hadn't worked closely enough with the community members involved and potentially you know, we hadn't involved you know, the right people. I think there's a bunch of issues and questions there that you know, are probably debatable and there's no, there's no single answer but some things that we, we didn't get right. The big thing for me when design, co-design anywhere, but particularly with community, is that it takes a very specific mindset. And so I talk about you know, a collaborative mindset, but also a growth mindset, you know, that belief that change is possible. Uh, a belief that you know you can be wrong and that you will grow and change during the process, not just the other people in the room. A sense of curiosity about what might be, you know, rather than bringing in our own biases and our business as usual approaches. A sense of optimism, you know, possibility, a results focus. You know, we will get to something that will make a difference. Um, adaptive, you know, that we will change what we do to suit local circumstances, to make sure that we adapt the way we think and the way we work to the results that we've agreed to achieve together. Empathy, you know, that sense of really being able to try and walk in other people's shoes and understand things from a different perspective. And I like this one, I got this from a banker actually, hustle. The idea that, you know, you can't just ride the I show up at nine and go home at five, business as usual wave. There's got to be a sense that you know, you're passionate and you have energy and you will make something happen. So for me, rather than co-design being the silver bullet, you know, the thing, I think it's, it's part of a toolkit that needs to include uh, you know, that relationship building, that work preparing people beforehand, project management skills, you know, particular mindsets, and all of these other things. Um, the term bricolage comes from Claude Levi-Strauss, for anyone who's interested, an anthropologist who talks about how you sort of bundle things together to, to make things work. Um, I won't elaborate on that now. The other, the other perspective, which is just a neat analogy, I think, is the analogy of a GP. You know, our health, our health system today is full of all of these specialists. You know, you've got specialists for different joints, for your heart, for your lungs, for, for all sorts of body parts and situations. And it's the GP that pulls things together. It's the GP that refers you to the right people. It's the GP you go back to when you need to follow up. It's the GP that gives you advice around maintaining your health generally and, and you know, engaging in preventative health care and medicine. And I think for me, that's the role that we really need when you're co-designing in the community space. It's that person who will combine, who will bring co-design in when it's needed, but has a whole toolkit of other resources that they can draw on as well to create the right solution. So finally, um, just a little analogy. You know, it's that thing of how do you learn to ride a bike? You can read it in a textbook, you can try and study the physics of it, but really the only way to learn is by doing. And I think this is something that's really important in co-design, again, generally, but also with community. You actually need to involve yourself in the process to understand the dynamics and how things work. And we're done just on time, so thank you. Um, this is the second time David's presented here, and if you're interested to um, hear his other talk, pop along to the YouTube channel and you can listen to it there.